We've been going through the Masterpiece series, and Kat has been so gracious enough to come up, and during the worship periods, and, and during last Sunday, even during the sermon, she's been making a sculpture. And um, we, were, we were talking about it, and we didn't have anybody, we have to clarify, we didn't have anybody saved that wanted to be baptized today. We had people that wanted to be baptized, but there's something else we needed to do first. So without the baptisms, we were talking, and we're like, you know what? It would be great to have the visual and go through the steps. And as Kat uh, described the steps to me, I'm like, oh, wow. Because it's all about the process. And so, Kat, if you want to take it away with the first one. Hi. Okay, I'll use my mic. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. Thank you for having me back. So hard to see from here. So they put a little bit on video, too. So go. what we've got here, this is called an armature, or the structure that's going to hold up the clay. It's underneath, when I, whenever I do a large um, sculpture, it, it's needed to actually hold all of the clay that's going to go on it. And, and even down to like the tiniest little detail as far as what's in through here, the, what you can't see underneath this is the chicken wire that actually holds this part of the, the armature or the um, sculpture up for that. So um, obviously this is gonna take a little bit to do this as far as um, creating this. You can see that there's weld tacks here and, and for me, what I wanted to just explain is, is the metaphor of this for us as we are being um, developed and created into uh, what we're called to do and what we need, we have to, this part of it, really our job is to be still, hold the position that he places us in. It teaches us to withstand some fire, but little, little, tiny little ones, because when you're tacking, a weld on here like this, it, ha it, it you have to have the positioning correct and then hold it in, hold it in a still spot. Does that make sense? And so, um, but it's not like a huge blast of fire. It's just a tiny little spot in a, what's called like a tack weld. And it's, um, for us, our job, the metaphor or the lining up or the, the likeness of it is, um, again, being still, holding the position that the Lord puts us in and it kind of like a training ground to get us used to a little bit of fire in our life. <laughs> well, in the concept of the foundation, if you want to turn to Luke chapter 6, verse 46 through 49, it says, So why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, Jesus said, when you don't know what I, what I say? I will show you what it's like when somebody comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It's like a person building a house and he digs deep and he lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against the house, it stands firm because it's well built. But anyone who hears and does not obey is like a person who builds the house without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. In Matthew 7, 21 through 27, um, there's more details that just fit this importance of a foundation. It says, Jesus says again, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, we cast out demons in your name, we perform miracles in your name, but I will reply, I never knew you. That's the scripture that used to really scare me. It says, get away from me, Jesus said, because you who break, you are the ones who break God's law. Now, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is a wise person. And they're like the person who builds a house on the solid rock. Those who, then when the rain comes, the torrents and floods rise, and the wind beats against the house, it won't collapse because it's built on the bedrock, and it's the bedrock of Jesus. But anyone who hears the teachings ignores it like a fool will be a person who builds a house in the sand. And when the rains and the floods come and the winds come against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. You know, not only do we need to use the word in such a way that we apply it to our life, it's like attaching to the footings of Jesus. And he's the bedrock. And even corporately, not only do we attach to him, but God, in, in, the, in the whole concept of um, the body of Christ, 
The Hebrew word for unity means taking several different pieces of metal, putting them in such fire that they, they melt together as one. And so we have the foundation that we attach to, and then we allow God through the trials to actually bring us together in strong unity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really cool. And the, another, another piece to add to that as well is that um, in order to be that part of the body of Christ, we need to know, really know the fullness of who we are first. And so there's, there's two different elements to that there that, that is really, really interesting that we need to understand and know and remember is getting ourselves developed, letting him do with us so that we can be that part of the body um, when we all come together. So there's two elements there. It's so, so good to remember. Um, and then just that key, key word is obedience. In order to stand and, and, and to be there, we need to stay in the position that he places us in. Stay in our lane, stay in that position, and then also just, again, learning to withstand the fire and trust him in that place. So then the next spot, okay. Next we have the next. Scripture. Yep. So this one, before it gets to this wonderful <laughs> spot, there's the, the clay that the Lord, and you can see, that it's really, really hard and it's really cold and how the block of clay actually comes for me and it starts out is, is it is, it's in a big block and it's hard and it's cold. <laughs> are we hearing the metaphor there? Are we hard, are we cold? We need to let him soften us. I'm gonna put this down for a second. I even have to use two hands sometimes to get it to that place. So us in allowing the Lord to make us pliable. This is what it takes. Can you imagine the pressure? You guys can see what, I'm, what it's taking. The pressure sometimes that we need to withstand, that we need to understand that when we're going through process, this is what it kind of feels like sometimes. And it's hard. And it's, oh, but for me, the key word is let him. Let him do that. It can be an experience where it's a white knuckling and we can fight it or we can let him do this for us. Again, it's a standing and, and allowing and an obedience in that part, in that place. And then when it does get, I'm gonna use a smaller piece because it's easier, it's quicker. When, it, when we get to that pliable place, can you see how easy it is? There's less work. Can you see that? how it's, okay, now I'm, I'm warm, <laughs> I'm pliable, I can be applied, and I can be um, added to this structure now in this piece, and, and then you can also see the tiny, tiny details. I don't know how well, oh good, you've got a good spot up there. So obviously a really big structure, but then um, the tiny, tiny details of this area here takes forever. The tools are really small for me that I use. They're, they're, they're little. You guys can come up later if you want to and I'll explain it even more, but they're little, they're tiny, and they make the smallest little change and just this adding of this on even with the fingertips. Look at how small that little piece is and the necessary of the of that um, standing again in the process where he adds or he takes away. Okay. In Isaiah 64, 8, it says, And yet, O Lord, you are the Father, and we are the clay, and you are the potter, and we are all formed by your hand. Um, as I was driving back from South Dakota, you know, midnight, I, the song came on, and I loved it when it first came out, but it's like, you're making diamonds out of dust, you're making diamonds out of us. Well, he had been talking about this process. Well, what does it take to make a diamond? A lot of pressure. A lot of pressure over a long time. And that's the refining process. And the more you're willing to allow God to use the pressures, you know, there's a dynamic in relationships. You know, there just is, and, and uh, you know, there's, you have to be able to, to embrace the hard times, embrace the conflicts, embrace those situations, and if you do that and let God guide you through it, it's his hands molding and shaping you, 
And, you know, even in prayer, when you, you bring up your, your conflicts and your trials to God in prayer, what you're really doing is, is you're putting yourself in God's hands and letting him soften and mold you so that he can use you to change the situation. Yep. Create flexible mold and mother mold. So then the next stage is very interesting. So when I complete a sculpture like this, this obviously is not done right now. I, I brought this on purpose this way because for me, it's like we're always in process. <laughs> there's always more, there's always changes. But the next step, if this, <clears throat> excuse me, if this piece was completed, I would do what's called a flexible mold over the top of it. And I literally use silicone caulking. There are other um, products that you can use, but that's what I prefer. And in that stage, I have to do layer upon layer upon layer so it, until it gets about this thick. So it's household, bath, and kitchen caulking, actually. I do a real thin layer to start with, and, it, and then it goes from there to, like I said, I have to cure it 24 hours in between each layer. And then it gets to this point where it actually... So can you do that? Sure. Let me take that out. Should we go down in front so they can see this one? And then mm -hmm. do that. Okay. So we want to come close so that you guys can see this because this is the example I brought is a little on the smaller side. So what it looks like to start with is it looks like this. Yeah. Okay. So then when that's all cured, it, it takes me at least a week to do this because again you have to let let it cure for 24 hours. So again, that process, that going through. A lot of this is standing still, isn't it? A lot of it is just letting him do things in us and just being in that place where he's placed us. So, but then obviously, how am I gonna get that, um, that clay out of there? Well, then there's a cutting stage. Ooh. Okay, and it's very tedious, and I have to be really super careful when I'm cutting this. So I have to take a very sharp instrument and cut along this place to get that mold that's inside of there out. So the clay piece has to come out, okay? Oh, I forgot a step. I forgot the mother mold. So with this on the, the with the clay or whatever still inside, is that the right way? Mm -mm. This one. I have to put a plaster on either side of that in what we call is a mother mold to hold that structure in place because you could see how flexible and flimsy that was um, because of the next step that comes after this. Um, so, and you have to do it in two sides, obviously. So I do the one side first. This is all liquid to start with and then it firms up really, really quick and that holds this piece in place. So that's called the mother mold. So when that's all taken out, here, I'm gonna put that back on top. Got it? Okay, sure. <laughs> you sure? Okay. So then I take this out. I have that all ready. So then the next step is to put it actually back in the mother mold, all back together. Once that's all cut out. There we go. This isn't gonna fit, but that's okay. Good example. So now it's all enclosed once again. That cocoon stage that we can be in but the, what, the place where it takes in the transformation now is that I've got what's called a reverse or a negative of that positive. So if you look at the sculpture, the sculpture that's up there, that's a positive. When I take that sculpture out of here, there's now a negative where I'm gonna pour actual liquid wax into this and let it cool. And then I will take that out. This is a different sculpture, but I will take that out. And then what I have is another positive of my sculpture. Does that make sense? Y'all tracking with me? Smile and nod. <laughs> There's a lot of steps, in other words. A lot of steps to the process. Yep. Okay. I'll let you. Should we go back up? Okay. Okay. So in Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God, because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that will be acceptable. This is true, um, this is the true way 
or this is how we truly worship him. So it's, it's literally placing our body, ourself, in God's hands and letting him use us, sculpt us into his image. And that's real worship. And it, it happens 24-7 in your life. It's submitting yourself to his pressure and sh letting him shape you. And then it goes on from there to say, don't copy the behavior and the customs of the world. It's not what he's shaping us into. But I, I think, obviously, if you let the hands of this world and this culture and everything around it shape you, you won't look, you won't be the image that God created you to be. So he says, but God says, let God transform you into a new person, into a new image by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know um, God's will for you, which is good and pleasing for you. We'll go on to the next stage. Yeah, so... Next step, can you believe it? I love this, I love this scenario and I love how this process is so parallel to what we can, we go through in our lives where we start out here and even before that it's started, even before that there's the design work and, and what are we gonna use to, um, you know, where, what, what image are we going to use to get the end product and so the lord in in <laughs> obviously we were he knew where we would be here even today sitting but the um just the beauty of this whole process how it what we go through so we hear and we go here and then there's a negative and there's a positive and there's this continuous process and this continuous transformation so then the next step we have the wax, so we have another positive of, of, this, of the structure and the mold, or the sculpture. The next thing here, what happens is, this is taken and done a, another process of, it's called sprueing and gating. And this, um, it's that, that's the ventilation, that's the, when, because when you do a pour, when you pour the bronze, it's in a liquid state, and it has to be able to get from here to here in the mold that it's in without freezing up and getting too cold. Does that make sense? So they do that step, but then they also put it into another mold. So it's also even like another cocoon stage um, that they apply a ceramic shell over the top of the wax sculpture. And then what happens? And then, oh, sheesh, am I ready? Then that actually, that ceramic shell gets put into a, an oven, into a kiln, and that wax gets melted out. And then they heat up the bronze. You can see the crucible way at the back. It's a huge crucible that they're tipping and pouring the liquid bronze into the um, smaller crucible, it's heated to about 1,800 to 2,000 degrees. So this is where we really need to know how to withstand a fire, so that fire process to begin with. And then what they're doing is they're putting that shell, another negative mold, and they're putting it into a sand pit, and they're keeping it hot. They're keeping the mold hot while the bronze pours in so that that shell doesn't split and then also so that the bronze stays hot as it's pouring through all those fine tiny little details. I would like to be a part of that step. <laughs> you have to be trained well to be let in that. <laughs> what I don't, I mean, when I look at that, how many have been through trial by fire? Not physically, but you know what I mean. And it's interesting how it's like God knows too that if you just go from 1800 to 2000 degrees to cold, <laughs> it, it would break you. It would. And so he, you know, he knows too that he, it's like he keeps the heat on and he gradually takes it off. And we're so instant, you know, in our mindset that it's like God changed this. And so God knows um, if we just trust him uh, that, that he's doing a process in us. And, and there's heat, you know, there's pressure, but it's all making us into the image that he created us to be um, from the beginning of time. And it's, it's also, what is that image? 
we're a masterpiece. And if we let him do that, we become a very visible piece of the master. You know, and, and the more he shapes us, the more he allow, we allow him to do that, the more people begin to see, oh, that, he looks like Jesus. He looks more like God. And that, that's the finished product, but we're always in process. I think we're to finish and patina. Oh, let me do James first, trial by fire. How many, I mean, this was never my favorite verse, all right? James 1, 2 through 5. You know, I, I remember it was my only C on a paper in Bible college. You know, and we had to do it as a team, and the other guys weren't doing anything, so I did it myself, and that's part of why I got <laughs> docked off. But it's like, uh, explain how God, explain the purpose of pain and suffering. First of all, I'd never take that topic again theologically, but James 1, 2 through 5 says, Dear brothers and sisters, when trouble comes your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Whatever. You know, I mean, it's like, goody, I lost my job. Woo, let's celebrate. You know, it's like I, I got a picture earlier this morning of somebody's niece who at 14 snuck out to uh, rendezvous with her 15-year-old boyfriend that didn't have a license, and they hit a telephone pole. And she had just qualified for state um, with 16 through 18-year-olds in fast-pitch softball. And they're still figuring out how many fingers are broken, there's a leg broken, and, and you're like, God, where are you in this? And yet, he is, and, you know, the parents and the relatives are praying, and God can do process in them, but you also pray that God does process in her, you know? And, and she lets God come into that. And, you know, as parents, we all hope they learn from that. Because there's parts of the process we really hope <laughs> that don't have to be repeated. Amen? So it's counted all joy. And, and it says, for you know that when your faith is tested... When you're under that pressure, when you're in the fire, then your endurance has a chance to grow. Now, we don't typically see our growth, you know? <laughs> I think we see from the inside of the master's hands and the inside of the mold. We just see the pressure. We feel the fire. But if we allow the master to have his way, those around us begin to see what God is shaping us to be. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Mm -hmm. yep. So next stage is not shown here. I don't have any images of that. But it is the after the bronze pour. It is the breaking off of that ceramic, ceramic shell that I told you about that they encased and that you saw them pouring the bronze into. That literally needs to be hammered off. Hammered off. And that goes away, and then they do the metal work of um, any, sometimes there's fills that need to take place because there's little pinholes. Sometimes there's a, a portion that didn't fill, and they have to literally weld that in in a bronze weld. Um, there's work to be done as far as how to, if we're going to place this on the uh, piece like this, if it's not a standalone bronze, it has to be what's called a drill and tap here and an attachment um, so that it can be put into the stone that it's gonna be in. Um, there's polishing that needs to take place to, because it's, bronze is a very porous material and it needs to be, um, you can close it up by using little Scotch-Brite pads on a power tool that actually closes those pieces down so that the patina will take really well. And then that the, after that's all done, that metal work is all done, then there's a patina that is the color that's on the outside. I actually make my own patina, don't tell anybody, just kidding, with, at, literally with nitric, nitric acid and nails that are not just steel nails. And it's a little chemical process. <laughs> it's, a, it's pretty hilarious to watch and you want to wear a good mask when you're doing that. So. <laughs> Just so you know, this is recorded and you Push will be Push it in now, and uh, yeah. run away, because, wow, it's yeah. nasty. Homeland Security will be following you. <laughs> it's okay. I do it in, a, in an open field where nobody's there, which is pretty funny. Right. Anyways, what that does is it creates this 
beautiful reddish color that you can see on here that is actually applied again with fire. It's another blowtorch that I use with propane tank. It's a weed burner. Have you ever seen a weed burner? They're about this big around and you literally blowtorch, heat the metal really, really well and apply with a tapping and a, a, a brush, a little, it has to be a natural brush and you'll tap that on and then you torch that color on so that I get to choose the color because you know bronze will turn into a really interesting green. Statue of Liberty is a great um, um, example of the green that it would turn that color under natural oxidation process, but this way I can choose the color that it turns out to be. There's several different colors. I just love this beautiful red color that it turns. Final stage, while it's still hot, we put a paste wax over the top of that, and that's what actually, once that's all cooled down, you buff that down to a really pretty shine that you can see, and that seals the patina, and then it also um, uh, makes it nice and shiny. I'm going to finish my process of <laughs> preaching down there, but let, let give, let's give Kat a hand for all that she's done. <laughs> Amen. You know, I was thinking about the patina, and it's like, what, um, you know, what color, what shine, how does that matter? In Mark 8, 34, uh, going to 9, 10, it says, Then, calling to the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If anyone wants to be a follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up the cross, and follow me. And if you try to hang out, or hang on to this life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for the sake, and for the sake of the good news... You'll be saved. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but you lose your soul? If anything, is anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message um, in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of you and of that person when he returns to the glory of the Father with the holy angels. And Jesus went on to say, I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they will see the kingdom of God arise in great power. Now, how many struggle with that verse? Because he's saying, while he's still alive, that there's a group of people that aren't going to die until they see the kingdom of God arriving in great power. So it's like, in a literal sense, you're like, well, then did Jesus come the second time? I remember as a, a teenager and even in college, I'm like, huh. But in the context of Scripture, it goes on. And what's next? I'll tell you. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up onto a high mountain to be alone. And as the men watched, Jesus' appeared, or appearance was transformed. And his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly uh, bleach could ever make something. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking to Jesus, and Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful us, for us to be here. Let's, let's make three, you know, let's build, let's build three churches right here as a memorial, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And he said this because he didn't really know what else to say, for they were all, they were terrified. Then the cloud overshadowed them, and the voice from the cloud said, this is my dearly beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly... When they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and only Jesus was with them. And as they were back down on the mountain, he told them not to tell anybody what they had seen until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. So they kept it to themselves, but they often asked each other, what did he mean by rising from the dead? Now, I read that because that's the Mount of Transfiguration. So in Romans chapter 12, we have be transformed. Here we have transfigured. They're the same Greek word. And you, it's metamorpha, and it's the process of metamorphosis from a caterpillar to a butterfly. And if you watch the processes of this, I didn't realize until Cal was explaining to me that the cocoon stage, actually there were several cocoon stages, and it's that you have to let yourself rest in God. You know, on the seventh day, God rested. He said, obey the Sabbath day and keep us holy. We keep working seven days a week and we can't figure out why we, you know, we're so frustrated and we have no rest because rest is such a huge part of the process, but especially resting in God. 
And I've, as I've prayed about this transformation and understanding it's what God wants to do in you. It's the process. You know, and, and I'm like, you know, fine, get me in that cocoon and get me out so we can be done. It doesn't work that way. And, and I even think of, there, there's other insects where there's several different stages. And there is, you know, there's a, a period in between each stage where they hibernate, you know, where they have to rest before the next change comes. And that's the process of transformation in our life. But how, how does transfiguration fit into it? Well, how did Jesus look different? On that mountain when, you know, Peter, James, and John, they looked upon him. In the other uh, Gospels, what did they see? He, he glowed with the glory of God. It's glistening white, all right? And in a vision that I had as I was praying through this several years ago, and I tried to draw it, and I talked to Kat about, she has an artist that can, I can probably get to finally draw it but it was a believer coming, breaking forth out of the chrysalis. And so, the, the, you know, their head comes out first and then the pointy tops of their wings. And if you've ever seen, because I, I, I was so into this process and I'd purposely go look for the little striped caterpillars so I could watch a monarch come out, you know? And the first, the, the, the tips of the wings come out and you, they're wet and as they dry, you know, it, it's like, as a, as a winged warrior of God, the wings would become translucent as they dried. And as, as a believer comes out of the process of, you know, being at rest with God and letting all that pressure lead to him being in the image of God, he glows with the glory of God. Just like Jesus did, that's the patina. What he wants to shine forth is the glory of God. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of... The glory of God. In most of my life in the church, we focused on the first part, the sin, and not the glory of God. But if we fell short of the glory of God and he sent Jesus back, what's his goal? To return us and to restore us to the glory of God. And the scripture that deals with that too is with Moses. Moses. And it talks about in 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 18, it says the old way with the law was etched in stone, led, and that led to death. Though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to even look at Moses' face, but his face shone with the glory of God even though the brightness was already fading away. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way? Now that the Holy Spirit has given life, in the old way, which brings condemnation, there was, it, it was glorious. But how much more glorious in the new way, which makes us right with God. In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared to the overwhelming glory of the new way. Now, who's in the new way? That's an overwhelming glory. We are. I'm glad you're so excited about that. Thank you for just shining forth the glory of God this morning. <laughs> Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. Christine walked up to the mother of the shooter at a memorial for th the three people that he shot. And she, she embraced that mother she forgave her and she embraced her in love. How did she do that? Because the glory that we walk in now is far greater than the former glory. And in doing that, she shined forth the glory of God. And that's the patina that God wants. If we'll just rest in him and let him finish his process and continue to work on us, we'll shine forth the patina, the glory of God. And the secure base, if you look at the end, if the final product doesn't stay and remain secured to the base, it can just be broken again. Okay? We experienced a little of that on the way into the church, on the two-wheeler. It 
fell and the middle one just bent. I was like, oh, no. Thank God it was attached to something secure, but we had to wait till it warmed up and apply pressure. She bent it back. But it's so important that it remains attached to the foundation of Jesus Christ. So in Romans 12, 3 through 5, after Paul talks to us about the importance of transformation, God turning you into that winged warrior that shines forth his glory, he says, because of the privilege and authority God has given you, I give each of you this warning. When you're parading around like a princess with wings on and you're you know, radiating the glory of God, now this is St. Bart's translation, it says, don't think that you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself, measuring yourself by, by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have, been, have parts and each part is, has a special function, so it is with the body of Christ. We are many parts, but we all belong together. Now, I have a few final thoughts and I have down here, and this is what I called them, because this sermon, I can't even remember when it originally came to me, the series, but it's at least nine months ago. In fact, I know it. it was last year at Easter, so it's a year ago. And over the year, we talk about it in staff, I pray about it, and I wrote all these notes down. And then I found a bunch of these notes this week after I wrote the series. So these are the final thoughts, and I have thoughts from the cutting floor. And so a masterpiece, it says, if you truly are a masterpiece as a believer, then you're a piece of the master. And also, you are the clay that if you allow him to work you, he makes into the sculpture. And then when all comes together, all of these sculptures, can you imagine? God is so incredible as the designer of the universe and the creator of each one of us. His master plan is not just for your individual sculptor, but all of us fit together into the one sculpture, which is the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. Now, I ask you this. Do you want to be a bright spot on that wedding gown? <laughs> or do you want to be the spot or the wrinkle? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so if we keep in mind that letting him make us pliable not only changes us and brightens us, it brightens the body of Christ. And it prepares the bride of Christ to be received by the bridegroom. And so when you keep the end in mind, it's much easier to endure the process. It doesn't have to look, and that's the other thing is that you're not a knockoff. Your value as a masterpiece is in direct proportion to how much Jesus is in you. God's not interested in any knockoffs. And, and you see this in the church and Christianity all the time. You see it in the music world. I don't know how many times, you know, I'm driving down and if I have a secular radio station and I hear an artist, and I think it's another artist, and it turns out to be a new artist. It just sounds like a different artist. You know? And they, a lot of times they don't even realize it. They just spent their life trying to sound like the person they really liked. When all of us are supposed to just tune ourselves to the tuning fork of Jesus, not each other. Um, it doesn't have to look like anyone else. It says, put down the brush and surrender it to the master. And, and there's so many, I mean, Christianity to me can be, religion is us trying to do the work of the Father on us. You know? And so many times we get, when we get frustrated with our walk with God, it's because we're doing his part. And if we're doing his part, we can't do ours, and he can't do his part. So if you just let him do his part, then maybe you will have the strength to do your part. You get what I'm saying? He's the artist. So let him have the tools in his hand. You know? I went through a period in the church where the book, famous, you know, the books were how to move the finger of God, you know, how to, how, how to command God to answer your prayers. And I'm just going, time out, wait a minute. We are not the commander in chief, he is. You know, he's in charge of the army. It's like, if you're commanding the chief, I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave this uh, platoon here because it's going somewhere I don't want to go. I want him to be commanding, and I want to be, the, I want to be what's in his hand. I want to be the ones receiving his marching orders. You, you're not a paint by numbers. That's religion. You know? I mean, church growing up to me was a thousand what you could not do. 
And each one was a number that you had to try to accomplish every day. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. If I do all these thou shalt nots, maybe there'll be a picture that looks like Jesus. Not. <laughs> what makes you beautiful is letting God control the brush. Counterfeits are just illusions. It's a deception. Know the truth, and by knowing the truth, you submit to the master's hand, you yield to his hand, and he makes you into an image that reflects his glory. So, Satan wants you to focus on the dirt. But God, the process with God is we're dirt. But the Holy Spirit is his breath, and just like he created Adam from earth, when we are recreated, if we let him breathe in us and we focus on his breath instead of the dirt, then we'll walk in his spirit and be what he wants us to be. The last image that, that I left out even at Easter was that of um, the, the image that, that we use uh, and is used for the souls of ministry, and that's when pottery is broken. And when it gets put that back together in Kintsugi, it's with gold, and that's what they, they put it back together with. And then when they put it in the, the kiln, just like a weld, you know, we were talking welding when we were preparing for this, you know. And I grew up with the old arc welder and the, you know, the welding rods. And there's, you know, it's really embarrassing on the farm where you got to go, hey, Dad, it's like, what? Uh, you, 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 the rod is stuck to the metal. <laughs> it's like, well, you didn't have it hot enough. Well, it's like, duh, but help me get it off. Um, I, now it's hard to go find welding rods. It used to be in every hardware store. Because now then they had wire feed and TIG welders. But it's the process of melting the two pieces of metal together and then the weld, if it's done right, is stronger than the original metal. Well, the same thing's true with this kintsugi. Where the gold is, that's stronger than the clay. But just think, the more you're broken and the more you put yourself in the master's hand, the more of Jesus is in you and Jesus is the gold. I don't know about you. I'd much rather be more gold than, than, than dirt. Just remember, the enemy wants us to focus on the dirt, but God, God teaches us to focus on the gold. So God, I just thank you for the fact that you're just pouring into us, that, that we are your masterpiece and we're a work in process. And if we just submit to you daily, we call upon you, whether it's on a ride that's stuck or wherever we're at in, in, in our life, in our daily walk, if we just call upon you, we... <laughs> We surrender to the master's hands. We, we let you intervene in our situation. We invite you into our circumstances. And, and, and God, you will carry us through. And Lord, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood in the fiery furnace, God, if, if you're in it with us, just like you were in it with them, God, not only are you going to help us through it, but you're going to change us in the process. So we submit to you, God. And I pray that no one would leave here today with not understanding their new, their new identity. They, they are a masterpiece of God in process. And whatever the enemy says, it's like, you know what? God isn't finished with me yet. But when he is, I'm going to look like him. And I'm going to radiate his glory. And every day, our goal is to radiate your glory more. In Jesus' name, amen.